From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the JAMA Oto podcast series. I'm your host, Paul Bryson from the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Evan Grayboys from the Medical University of South Carolina. He serves as the Director of Survivorship and Cancer Outcomes Research at the Hollins Cancer Center. He's an otolaryngologist and head and neck surgeon. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Grayboys. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, I really appreciate your time. We have an upcoming publication that you've led on neighborhood-level disadvantage and delayed adjuvant therapy in head and neck cancer. It's uh, an important article that describes some of the disparities that we see and some of the barriers to completing the treatment course for head and neck cancer. Can you take a moment and just tell the listener a little bit about the study and and maybe what prompted your investigation of this important topic? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we know for patients with local regionally advanced head and neck squamous cell carcinoma that National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN guidelines, recommend starting radiation within approximately six weeks of surgery. And this guideline is based on a number of studies that have shown a strong association between timely initiation of adjuvant therapy or post-operative radiation therapy report and oncologic outcomes like local regional recurrence and survival. As a result of this strong association, um, back in 2021, the Commission on Cancer approved timely initiation of post-operative radiation therapy as its first quality metric for head and neck cancer. Despite its importance, approximately 50% of patients with head and neck cancer don't start port in a guideline adherent fashion. And we know that delays disproportionately burden racial and ethnic minority patient populations, those who are underinsured from lower income families and otherwise potentially medically vulnerable, and contribute in large part to disparities in outcomes in this patient population. From a public health lens, we know that determinants of health and health behavior happen at many levels. And although Most of the research has focused on individual level factors. Up to date, no one's really analyzed how what's going on in the neighborhood in which people are living may, in fact, be an important driver of disparities in this key aspect of care. One of the main outcome measures that you use in the study is this area deprivation index. Would you describe the the concept of this measure and how it's determined? Yeah, so I think accelerated by COVID, but really even predating COVID, there was an increasing interest from population health researchers in sort of understanding how to measure the multiple aspects of how built environment may impact health outcomes. It borrowed in large part, I think, from some of the work that was done in genetics to say that like one specific gene may not be important, but really it's how a bunch of different genes play together. And similarly, when thinking about evaluating neighborhoods, one specific domain like income or education or employment or housing or transportation only gives a part of the story. And if we can find a way to aggregate across these many components or domains, we may have a richer understanding of how to describe the neighborhoods in which people are living. And so there's a number of measures that have been used. We chose for this study the Area Deprivation Index, or ADI, which is an area-level measure composed of 17 variables across four domains, income, education, employment, and housing quality. And we selected the ADI for this study because it has been widely used across a number of studies and is widely considered one of the most accurate measures of U.S. neighborhood level disadvantage. ADI scores for any geographic area, in this case census block, are ranked at a national percentile from 1 to 100 or a state percentile from 1 to 10, with higher numbers indicating greater levels of disadvantage. A number of measures that have been used, we chose for this study the Area Deprivation Index, which is an area-level measure that captures 17 discrete variables across four domains income, education, employment, and housing, and describes the neighborhoods in which patients live. We pick this variable as our primary variable because it's been used widely in prior studies evaluating U.S. neighborhood level measures of disadvantage. It's evaluated on a score of either 1 to 10 at the state level or 1 to 100 at a national level, with higher numbers representing greater levels of neighborhood disadvantage. Well, thanks for that explanation. It seems like a nice way to kind of capture a lot of the different domains that impact people's access to the healthcare systems, you know, particularly specialty care. So yeah, just walk us through, what did you find? I wanted to congratulate you on the 
multi-center aspect of this study. What did you find? Thanks. So in this study, we sampled patients from four different academic medical centers in different regions of the United States with some different, I think, potential characteristics. And across these four academic centers, we identified 681 adult patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma who underwent curative intent surgery, followed by port from 2018 to 2020. What we did is once these patients were identified, each of them was geocoded. So using locational data that could be abstracted from the electronic health record, we were able to assign a location to them and then match this to census block data and use that to then understand the neighborhood level characteristics of where these patients were living and evaluate how those neighborhood level characteristics were associated with um, port delay. So does a patient start radiation within six weeks or not? Yes or no but also time to port as a continuous measure to see potentially like are more severe levels of disadvantage associated with longer times in a dose dependent manner, and then making sure to adjust for relevant demographic, clinical, or institutional characteristics, which might confound that association. Yeah. I mean, I get the sense that, you know, I think for those of us that take care of patients with head and neck cancer, I think there's this sense that they oftentimes may have barriers to care, maybe a disadvantaged group. What about the results were surprising to you and the team? Or was this kind of what you expected to find? Great question. So I think we knew going into the study from work led by our team and from others across the country, I think at Kansas and Stanford and UC San Diego and Montefiore, a little bit about individual level clinical and demographic factors that may be associated with delay starting radiation. I mean, there are some existing conceptual models describing how barriers may exist at maybe the patient level or the provider level or the institution level, but no one to date had quantitatively described the contribution of these neighborhood level indices. And so I think that was the major gap the study was trying to address was to move from just describing individual patient barriers to saying like, it's not about the individual patient demographics, but potentially the neighborhoods in which they're living that impacts the way they're receiving care. And so that was our hypothesis going in, that higher levels of neighborhood level disadvantage would be associated with port delays, and that increasing severity of neighborhood level disadvantage would be associated in a dose-dependent fashion with longer time to starting radiation. And that is, in fact, exactly what we found. And so in this study, we found that for each population level quartile increase, so each 25% increase in area deprivation index scores, patients had a corresponding 32% increase in the adjusted odds of having a port delay. And this was after adjusting for many, many confounding factors, like which institution they received their care at, their age, race and ethnicity, insurance, comorbidity, their cancer subsite, stage, even if they had postoperative complications, how far they had to travel. So many things that could explain a lot of what we've seen in clinical care about demographic and clinical factors. So even above and beyond that, what we know is the neighborhood in which patients are living really does impact their ability to receive guideline concordant care for this aspect of head and neck cancer care. You know, again, I, I congratulate you on trying to suss out some of these things. You know, I think just as a reader or as an observer, you think, oh, well, maybe it's just the distance from the center, right? You know, some of our cancer centers really are a beacon of care and specialized treatment for our states or our or our region. And you just think, oh, well, it's just because people are far away that they can't get there and and that that radiation therapy is a real commitment in time and travel. But it would seem that there's quite a bit more to it than that. It made me think of some other questions for you. You know, with the ADI, has there ever been anyone that's looked at the general ADI for all head and neck cancer patients or at various subsites of head and neck cancer? Is this, in general, a group that has more higher levels of deprivation index overall? So specific answer to your question is I'm not aware of any studies that have compared the neighborhood level disadvantage for patients with head and neck cancer compared to potentially other types of cancer or other otolaryngologic patient populations. So that's something that could certainly be explored in future research, or if that study has been done and I'm not aware of it, I apologize to the listenership. But I think that is a potentially important thing to quantify. And what I would say about this is it fits within the larger framework, and I would certainly expect those hypotheses to be true. I think it fits within the larger framework of saying that we now very clearly understand how social determinants of health, so how the places in which people are born, grow up, live, work, play, and die, affect every aspect of health along the continuum, and specifically in terms of cancer, how they may affect cancer incidence, access to screening, 
diagnostic resolution, treatment, care coordination, and onto survivorship. And so if this is an initial entryway into that larger lens for head and neck oncology, I think there is a wealth of studies describing disparities at the individual patient demographic level, race, ethnicity, insurance, and we're beginning to move towards intervent mechanistic studies to understand why those disparities have been so well described for the past 20 to 25 years, and then thinking about them less potentially in terms of individual level characteristics and more about the underlying ways in which environment shapes behavior across the cancer care continuum. Yeah, and it seems important, like these sort of studies could possibly be used to inform civic leaders, you know, at the local level, the regional level, the state level, at the national level. And you hope that, I guess another broader, maybe non-study related question is, have you found some interest in your local communities where perhaps this sort of data helps maybe marshal some community resources or measures to try to improve access to the neighborhood or region to, to come finish their treatment course? Yeah, so I think we're on the leading edge of what will hopefully be some sustained work to try and understand why. So this study is all descriptive and associative in nature, so we don't have a full understanding of why patients from uh, more disadvantaged neighborhoods are less likely to receive guideline and adherent adjuvant therapy. So that's, I think, the first step is to really understand why these associations are being held, but then hopefully to building upon that depth of understanding, translate this into meaningful changes at the appropriate level. And that's hopefully one of the long arcs of the Commission on Cancer Quality Metric in this space is it was specifically chosen, I think, because it has the opportunity to enhance health equity for patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And so now cancer centers where these data are being tracked, not for accreditation, but being tracked for internal reporting, Hopefully, leaders within each cancer center can have discussions with cancer center leadership about the type of resources that may be necessary at a cancer center level, which is very, very downstream, but still potentially has the ability to impact some of these neighborhood level determinants. And then longer arc, you're right, hopefully this is data that can be used by potentially with insurance companies or policymakers or people to understand how we can intervene at the neighborhood level in terms of multi-level strategies to enhance equity. And as much as I and others recognize the importance of head and neck cancer in the broader cancer care discussion, we also know that head and neck cancer is not as common as breast, lung, colon, and prostate. And so I think here the strategy is potentially to align with somewhat more prevalent cancers when thinking about how we can affect change at a policy or population level, because head and neck cancer just by itself often isn't common enough to generate interest at the policy level to change things like neighborhood built environment. I appreciate that perspective, and I suspect your colleagues, our colleagues, and those other subsites are probably doing similar work, and hopefully we're creating this sort of tapestry where we can tell a story that would have meaning to try to get more resources and help people finish their treatment course for some of these conditions that, that are treatable. Dr. Grayboys, I wanted to ask, you know, for listeners that might be interested in this type of research... How does this article fit into other work using the ADI and uh, the ADI and otolaryngology in general? Yes, we are definitely not the first group that has evaluated the association of neighborhood deprivation or disadvantage with outcomes along the healthcare continuum from disease incidents to treatment uh, outcomes thereafter. And there's a really enormous literature now that has demonstrated the strong and robust association between neighborhood level characteristics, and access to care. But specifically, I think within earlier oncology, we've seen a growing interest in this topic. And so when we were starting this line of research to help inform the most rigorous study design, we actually looked at sort of what had been done outside of the head and neck oncology space. And there's actually been quite a bit. And one of the studies we found quite helpful was actually published in JAMA Odo back in 2022 that looked at how neighborhood level deprivation affected otitis media incidents and outcomes in U.S. children in the United States. And we found this article to be really helpful in addition, there was a really great article led by Marcy Nielsen and colleagues up at the University of Pittsburgh that was published in JAMA Odo, actually just in February, so just very recently, evaluating neighborhood level deprivation and psychosocial distress in head and neck cancer survivors. So I think there's a growing corpus of articles that can highlight rigorous methodology for interested health services researchers who are interested in going into this space. And I, I would at this point, I think, 
pause to say that building a multidisciplinary team is really helpful for this kind of research. And so having someone potentially with um, expertise in geocoding, potentially someone with expertise in disparities or health services research, involving patients is always really helpful. And we've certainly involved patient advocates in our research to help guide it and keep it patient-centered. So I think growing models of um, ways to do this research rigorously in the otolaryngology space, and then hopefully moving in the future from just describing the association to understanding why, and then thinking through the multi-level interventions that may be necessary to actually improve outcomes in this space. Thank you for that. You know, as you look ahead, what's coming next or down the pipeline for some of the initiatives in this area? Yeah, so I think in the discussion of the manuscript, we talk a little bit about exactly sort of like what are next steps. And I think these are broken into a couple of broad categories. One is to, I think, recognize, as we mentioned before, that these studies, the findings are associative in nature and that we really need to unpackage, understand why. And really, once we understand why these associations are happening, it can lend further insight into how we should go about intervening to address upon them. From a very practical level as a, at a cancer center, we discuss what role patient navigation-based strategies may play in addressing these pervasive inequities. And that really has a lot of potential. And so our research team here at MUSC has been using a patient navigation-based approach to improve timeliness and equity of adjuvant therapy for a number of years in the research setting. And I think it holds great potential. One of the Rate limiting steps for patient navigation based approaches is that navigators are often a scarce resource. Within the last year, I think part of if the Biden administration has been leading a cancer moonshot or continuing the cancer moonshot, they've also been working on a cancer ground shot. And one of the major advances that came out of that was that, at least for Medicare now, navigation based services for patients with cancer are reimbursable. And so that's a huge win for the sustainability and scalability of navigation based approaches, which were had justified their cost effectiveness, but was always a real challenge. So I think reimbursing for that really opens up a whole new world of possibilities for how navigation-based approaches, which are really evidence-based, could potentially help in this aspect of care. And then I think for individual clinicians, they may say, well, you know, what am I supposed to do with this data? Like, I can't fix the community. I can't fix transportation problems. You know, I'm, I'm just here in my cancer center. And I think in those situations, we would say they're not either or options. And I think there are many things that can happen at the individual clinician level about care coordination, setting expectations, patient education, et cetera, that can supplement and address preventable sources of delay above and beyond what may be happening at the neighborhood level. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I hadn't heard about the, the ground shot, but it really makes sense, right? You know, at the end of the day, we have to, I think, help people navigate health challenges, navigate the health system and be at the front line of, you know, the daily operations and needs of people that interact in our center. So thanks for highlighting that. As we wind down this episode of the podcast, any take-home messages for the listener that you want to reinforce? Um, I think your last question really got to the crux of what I think many of the clinicians who are reading the article would want to know, which is like, what do I do when I go to work tomorrow that I should take away from this article? And I think there's a couple of take-home points. One is which this article reminds us that as clinicians, we're at the very sort of like downstream cascade of policies and procedures that flow from the government and insurance and organizations that impact how we practice. And while recognizing that that often constrains what we do, I, I do think it reinforces that we need to be aware of what's happening upstream because it impacts the care that we provide to each patient when they present to us for the best care and the guideline of hearing care that's possible. So I think just being aware of the multi-level influences that happen. And then two, I think to work within the local context of your oncology clinic or cancer center to understand what are those individual level or organizational barriers that may be actionable at the clinician level. And we've seen a lot of overlap across centers, especially I think through some American head and neck surgery quality improvement efforts led by Dr. DV, we've seen a lot of commonalities in this space. And so I think working at a local level recognizing that you're not alone. Many of these things are potentially addressable through improvements in coordination with dental oncology or radiation oncology or pathology or scheduling. So there are many actionable things that can lead to meaningful improvements. And they may seem small, but what we've seen from a variety of database studies that each week of delay beyond six weeks is associated with about a 7-10% increase in adjusted hazard of mortality. And in this study, we saw an eight-day difference by the group's for the median time to port 
And that eight days can make a difference in terms of local regional recurrence and outcomes. So even small differences, I think, in this highly constrained time interval can be impactful to patient outcomes. Well, thank you for your time today, Dr. Grayboys. I I really appreciate it. And again, uh, congratulate you on this work. And I look forward to seeing more from your group and really doing impactful work. So thank you. Thank you for the privilege of sharing and for all of your thoughtful questions on the topic. This episode was produced by Daniel Musisi at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.